20 years ago, I went to prison for the disappearance of my best friend. When it happened, I tried to explain exactly how it went down, but nobody believes me. Eventually, I caved in from being coerced by my interrogators and confessed to their version of events, and I pled no contest to the charges. Now that I'm finally free, even though the life I used to have no longer exists, I'm finally capable of sharing the true story. His name was Bennett, and we grew up together. Neither of us were strangers to crime, but most of what we did was petty stuff. We never robbed or killed anyone, but we had our habits and our hustles. Truthfully, we didn't do any of it because we had to. Both of us were from some pretty well-off families, and we just found it fun to break the rules sometimes. One thing we particularly enjoyed doing together was breaking into construction sites and abandoned buildings. We'd built up some confidence with that, and we never got caught doing any of it. Well, that was until we broke into the abandoned police station. The police department had just finished building a brand new station a mile or so down the road from the old one, which was built in the 40s, and it had already been outgrown by the size of the town many years ago. That meant there was this 60-year-old building with a ton of dark history that was now completely deserted. Bennett and I couldn't resist. We bought a knockoff Polaroid camera to capture some eerie images, and we wore empty backpacks to gather souvenirs. Getting in was easy. The fence was topped with barbed wire, so we cut the chain at the gate and slipped right through. Then we smashed the locks on the front door, which wasn't equipped with any alarms. Right away, we were like degenerate kids inside of an illegal candy store. We dug through the ancient records in the booking station, trashed the sheriff's office, and we tried to find abandoned weapons in the armory but all we found were some billy clubs. Then we found the jail cells. There were four of them lined up on one wall with the classic steel bars. Not only that, but on the far wall were the keys to the cells, just hanging there on a hook. Bennett and I started giggling like school children, thinking of everything we could do with the space. We decided to play cop and criminal, where one of us would lock the other one up in the cell and pretend to be a piggish deputy. We challenged each other to rock, paper, scissors to see who would be who, and I won. So, of course, I wanted to be the cop. I immediately started playing the character and ordered the criminal Bennett, who pretended to be in handcuffs, to get in his cell. Then I closed the gate behind him and I locked it with the keys. I could tell that Bennett was a little worried that I would intentionally leave him in there, but he tried to hide it and he kept the amusement going. We were lifelong friends, so I knew he trusted me. I wanted to mess with him, though. So I told him to have fun rotting and I walked away. Then I went to the sheriff's office and kicked my feet up on the desk. A little while later, Bennett started yelling like a jailbird. You better let me out, you goddamn pig, he shouted, his voice echoing through the cinder block halls. Shut up, you waste of flesh. You'll get out when you can pay your bail, I hollered back. You didn't give me no bail, you bastard, Bennett complained, chuckling a little bit. I know, because all your money is stolen. I couldn't help but smile myself after that. No, it ain't. You can't prove that. Not yet, I yelled. And then for a moment, Bennett didn't reply. But then out of nowhere, he dropped the act. I'm serious, man. Let me out, please. I can't take it in here anymore. A chill ran down my spine from the tone of his voice. I knew that he was being dead serious, so I got up from the desk and I ran down the hall to unlock the cell to let him out. But when I got there, he was gone. The cell door was still locked, but Bennett was gone. I started to panic, so I opened it up and I went inside to see if he was hiding under the bed, but he was nowhere to be found. Bennett! I called out, where are you? There wasn't a single sound in reply, except the echo of my own voice then the sound of the door sliding shut behind me. I rushed to the door to keep it from closing on me, and I managed to put my hand in the way in the last second, causing the door to crush my wrist. I cried out in pain, then I pulled the door open, but for some reason, it was like there was someone fighting against me, trying to shut it. When I finally got free, I was full of fear and adrenaline. I didn't even go looking for Bennett. We always agreed that if things went south, we would take care of ourselves and meet up later but Bennett never showed up. Days went by, then weeks. The police investigation of his disappearance led straight to me, and from there, you can already tell where the story's going. 
I got pinned for it. And even though I know I'm not responsible, I've always believed that there's nobody else on this plane of existence that should have taken the blame. Whatever got him almost got me too. Sometimes I wish it would have. In my career as a sheriff's deputy, I've seen and done more than my fair share of disturbing and traumatizing things. Of course, I've never really been able to share my experiences with many people, other than my wife and a few members of the force. But now that I'm retired, I've decided to write down the ones that have stuck with me the most over the years. This was just one day on the job. It wasn't a call that we weren't expecting. It didn't come out of the blue at all. In fact, most of us had been itching to take care of this issue for months, but we had been forced to wait for a warrant. There was this abandoned house in one of the neighborhoods we would patrol. The owners of the house died and they didn't leave the property to anyone, so it got foreclosed by the bank, who didn't touch it for far too long. Until they finally decided to mark it for demolition, when it had gotten to the point that it was about to fall over on its own. We got the warrant for the raid, based on the testimony of the contractor who went inside the house for a pre-demo inspection and came running to the station looking like he'd seen a ghost. From what the inspector said, we all had the same idea of what we were getting into. On the surface, it was obviously your typical trap house. We expected to find all sorts of drugs and squatters and illegal firearms, which we did. So we came prepared to make arrests. However, we could never have been ready for the full extent of what we discovered. We circled the house with about eight squad cars, plus a SWAT van from the next county over. It was the middle of the day, but none of the occupants even noticed what was happening outside. I wasn't on the front line, but I was several men behind the SWAT guys who announced our presence at the door before breaking it down. We only gave them about 15 seconds of warning them from the first shout to the door being rammed open, but that was enough time for several of the occupants to get up and scramble for the back door we of course had officers waiting to capture them. The SWAT guys charged in and they scared any of the rest of them from even thinking about putting up a fight. By the time I got in there, there were about a dozen people left on the first floor of the house and they were all on the ground and frozen already. However, it wasn't yet time for me to start cuffing them and getting them out of there. Mobilizing them with zip ties was the job of the officers who came in after me because even though the ground floor was secure, the house wasn't clear yet. There was a basement. While the other guys cleaned up the first floor, I backed up the SWAT team with another deputy, which was my partner at the time, as the armored men continued their march, heading down the stairs into the space below the house. I remember my heart was racing the whole time, like it would on any other high-intensity raid like that. I could feel the sweat soaking through my clothes, and it was like I could see 360 degrees all around me. But there was a distinct change in the air as I made my way down those steps. The SWAT team felt it too. They slowed their pace noticeably as we descended. The hairs on the back of my neck stood straight up, and I noticed the eerie quietness of the space I was entering, broken only by the noise from upstairs. I was overcome by a smell too. A stench, really. It was so distinct, but I didn't want to admit that I knew exactly what it was. For a moment, it was pushed out of my mind. The SWAT team started shouting at somebody, and I realized there was a man trying to escape the basement through one of the egress windows, but he was too overweight to fit through quick enough. Before he could get his midsection unstuck, I ran up, and with the help of my partner, yanked him down by the feet, sending him crashing to the floor, where we immediately tied his hands and feet together as per protocol. After a few more seconds, the tentative all clear was given, and it was time to start clearing out the arrested individuals and begin the investigation. At that exact moment in time, I was distracting myself from what I already knew by griping with my partner about having to eventually get the fat man we just arrested up the stairs, but he didn't even have time to respond. Off to the side, one of the SWAT members started going ballistic, shouting and cussing, and all of a sudden running over to the mobilized man and picking him up by the collar, screaming into his face. What the hell is wrong with you? I heard him growl, almost like he was about to cry, but the fat man didn't respond. My partner and I were stunned for a critical few seconds and didn't move to do anything. I knew we were both thinking, what could get to a guy like that who might as well be a trained soldier? Then the fat man with the blood pouring from his nose, face planting against the ground during his arrest, 
spat in the SWAT member's face, right in his visor. In an instant, the SWAT member lashed out and struck the man in the head with the butt of his rifle, effectively disabling him completely. I'm positive he would have kept on going and beaten him to death too if it weren't for the rest of the SWAT team rushing over to pull him off. By then, I was starting to feel an uneasy shakiness in my knees, and I knew that soon I'd have to accept the truth of what triggered that man's rage. That stench I noticed earlier, I had recently become quite familiar with it. My first son had just been born a few months prior, and the odor of infant fecal matter is quite recognizable. The SWAT team escorted their unhinged comrade back up the stairs and left me alone with my partner and the unconscious man we had just arrested. And all of a sudden, our surroundings came into focus. All around us were cribs. Six of them lined up against the walls of the cramped and dingy basement. In horror, we looked into them and what we saw has given me nightmares ever since. There were children in each of the cribs, and more than one in some of them, ranging from infants to toddlers. They were all in terrible distress and covered in feces. The reason we hadn't heard them crying in the chaos of the raid was because they were all, every single one of them, gagged by pacifiers, which were held in place over their mouths by cordage that was wrapped so tightly it was digging into their skin in some cases. Some of them were even tied up with bungee cords. I immediately felt so lightheaded that I almost couldn't continue standing. I wanted so badly to believe that what I was seeing couldn't be reality. I vaguely heard my partner call out for backup, but I forgot about doing my job. All I could think to do was pick up the baby that was squirming so helplessly in front of me and take out their pacifier so they could finally cry through their immense suffering. I cradled them in my arms and I tried to console them. And this is the sight and sound that many of my comrades on the force witnessed when they came rushing down the stairs. Through the investigation, it was found that many of the drug addicts that were squatting in that house had formed a sort of twisted, heinously neglectful daycare center for their unwanted children so they could get high in peace. All the children were put into the foster care system, and none of us ever saw any of them again. But I know for a fact that each of us has wondered about their fate every day since. I know I have. During the lockdown, my life was actually going pretty good in the first few weeks. I got together with my girlfriend just in time, right around when everything was closed and there was nothing else to do, which meant we had ample time to spend together in our budding relationship. I had recently started driving too, so it was kind of perfect. It was the end of our senior year in high school, and we both just turned 18 a few months ago. And we had almost no responsibilities. We would drive all around town and enjoy the lack of people, relish in each other's company, and of course, find secluded spots to park my car and be hidden from prying eyes. I'm sure anyone could imagine why. Unfortunately, that would end up bringing all the good times crashing down. It still seems so ridiculous and unfair that I get mad thinking about it even now, but there's nothing I can do to change it, so I figured I should share my story as a reminder that cops can be both unavoidable and insufferable assholes that will literally get off to ruining your life over the most minor of crimes. It was a night not too unlike any other. We were pulled up in the rear parking lot of a park in the neighborhood by our school, which was pretty dark at night, so we never thought that anyone would ever be able to see us. This particular night, before we got to our destination, knowing it was a Friday night and wanting to make it feel special despite the fact that all the days back then were running together, we bought a bottle of that knockoff fireball and picked up an eighth of weed. Another factor that did us in was that we were chronically blowing off both of our friend groups. It seemed like it didn't matter when my girlfriend's friends called her up and asked her a bunch of questions about where she was and ragged on her for not going out with them. What we didn't know was that they were so mad at her not partying with them that they literally called the cops on us, saying that I was some kind of drug dealer. We had no idea this was happening, so after she got off the phone, we walked out into the park, smoked a joint, and drank the whole bottle under the cover of darkness. Then we returned to my car and got in the back seat, where we started cuddling, then making out. Then we started taking off all of our clothes to go all the way. We were in the middle of doing it, when I saw out of the corner of my eye, three cops pulling into the parking lot with their lights off. 
I stopped what I was doing, stunned. Before I knew it, they surrounded my car so there was no hope of even driving away. I quickly told my girlfriend what was happening, and we both rushed to put our clothes back on, but it was too late. The cops started banging on the doors and shining their flashlights through the windows, completely exposing both of us. We were caught in the act. They shouted at us to get out of the car while we were still half naked. We were as freaked out as we could have been, so we panicked and we just decided to do what they said. As soon as I opened the door, this one big fat pig of a cop ripped me out of the car and threw me on the ground, handcuffing me immediately. My girlfriend was screaming and refused to get out of the car after seeing that, which led the other cops to reach in and yank her out. I couldn't see anything but the dirt in my eyes, but I could hear her struggling and trying to grab onto anything she could, but eventually they overpowered her and handcuffed her on the ground as a sobbing mess. Then they put all their flashlights on us so that all the people in the neighborhood around us who woke up from the screaming would be able to see exactly what was going on. Then they started asking us a million questions. I was so shell-shocked that I couldn't really think of what would have been the right thing to say. Their questions ended up with them searching my entire car while they left us on the ground. They found the weed and the empty bottle of alcohol, which I claimed to be mine immediately to save my girlfriend from any further trouble. They breathalyzed me, and since I was under 21, and even had a detectable amount of alcohol in my system, that meant I was immediately slapped with a DUI, and I got my license revoked, barely three months after I got it. On top of that, I was hit with a drug charge because of the weed. My girlfriend and I were both charged with trespassing because for some reason it's against the law to be in a park after dark. But the worst part of all this is because we were caught having sex in my car there, we were both charged with indecent exposure and committing a lewd act, which we ended up getting convicted for. That means we are now both registered sex offenders for the rest of our lives, just because we were having sex with each other in the back seat of my car, which I swear to God had such tinted windows that nobody could ever see us, especially at night. And you might be thinking that a lot of these charges could have been dropped, but the cop that inked me out of my car was so proud of his actions that when he showed up to the court date, he convinced the judge there was a mountain of evidence against me, proving that I was a total degenerate. He pointed to the open container violation, the intoxicated driving even though I wasn't driving, the marijuana, the indecent exposure, the trespassing, the anonymous tip from the friend that betrayed us, and the resisting arrest too. So the judge decided that at 18 years old, I needed to go to jail for 6 months and be on probation for years. The only silver lining is that my girlfriend avoided going to jail. And since she wasn't a minor, I avoided a much more serious charge. However, she was so traumatized by this event that she dumped me all while I was in jail. Just goes to show, cops are always looking for an excuse, so be careful out there. <laughs>